Matthew chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 2. Would love for you to find both of those passages with me in your Bible, on your smartphone, whatever works for you. If you need a Bible, our ushers are in the aisles. And uh, these two passages, I want to link them together for you and just kind of show you the fascinating history that goes into the Christmas story. And in Matthew chapter 2, uh, we'll pick up this part of the story this morning, and then the main event uh, we will save for tomorrow night. Monday night, Christmas Eve, you don't want to miss that, so I hope you'll all come back for one of our three Christmas Eve uh, services as we continue to add object of wonders uh, to the Christmas story here. Miraculum literally means in Latin object of wonder. And uh, so no surprise that today it's all about a king uh, who is worthy of our worship in whatever season of life uh, we are in. And uh, wow, the lyrics of that song are just absolutely amazing. Hey, why don't you stand with me, church? Let's stand in the honor of the reading of God's word and this portion of the Christmas story uh, that's given to us here in Matthew chapter 2. I'm going to read the first 12 verses of that chapter. Follow along, beginning in verse 1. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. Where are they from? Where are they from? From the east. I think you've all been up since 2 o'clock this morning as well. <laughs> They're from the east. They came to Jerusalem saying, Where is he who, was, who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled. And all of Jerusalem with him. When he had gathered all the chief priests and the scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. And they said to him, in Bethlehem. They knew the scriptures. In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, but you, Bethlehem. This is in Micah, in the Old Testament. But you, Bethlehem. In the land of Judah are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the young child. And when you have found him... Bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. Hmm, you really think so? No, doesn't want to worship, wants to murder this rival ruler, this king uh, that has been born. Verse 9, and when they, uh, when they heard the king, they departed and behold the star which they had seen in the east went before them. Until it came and it stood over where the young child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. I get a lot of Christmas cards, just amazing cards from friends and family and loved ones, church, people around the world. I got a Christmas card that said, a star led them to the light of the world. That's great. That's some great insight. A star led them to the light of the world. And when they saw the star... They rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Then being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. Lord, we just thank you so much for this amazing season that we love to celebrate. We even want to now learn more about it from this passage of Scripture. Would you speak to our hearts, give us ears to hear it, and Holy Spirit, stir us that we too, like the wise men, would leave differently than we arrived. 
for your glory. We pray this, your blessing over our time in your word, for your glory and for our good, in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen? Amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. Well, welcome everybody. Good to see you. Glad you're here. What an amazing three nights it's been. It's, it's truly, I, I, maybe I say this every year, it's my favorite. This year, my favorite, the flow, um, the gospel message, the number of people praying the prayer. We rented a bus and brought up the rescue mission. That was like the most grateful, appreciative group of the whole deal. They clapped at the end of every scene. They, they took pictures. They asked for autographs. It was amazing. It was, it was, it was great. And, and, and uh, it's just incredible, this church. You guys just all stepping up. And tonight, no exception, it'll really be great. So I hope you're back for that. But I got a couple things I just want to bring to your attention where the story is concerned. Some things are just sort of, I know it's very familiar with us. We know this story. And no surprise, these, these wise men now, they've kind of dropped everything. They've changed their whole schedule. They've left their own kingdoms to come and to worship the one who is worthy of our praise. And as they arrive, King Herod is pretty freaked out by their arrival. He's troubled. I want to know why. why. What's he freaking out about? I mean, and, 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 and I think you begin uh, to sort of put the puzzle together and realize the magnitude of who's come to visit. It just isn't like this wandering troop of astrologers that are excited because there's a star brighter than all of the others in the universe that they have now latched onto and are following. It's so much more than that. And, and, and not just magicians. I know that we use the word magi there, both in Greek and in Latin. This word magi is an interesting word and sounds like it's, you know, a short sort of slang um, nickname for magicians. And, and some church leaders have have, have sort of, you know, described them in that way and, and with good cause, but I'm going to show you there's so much more to who these guys are. Uh, to Turlian, who's a very early church father, he's got this uncanny description of the Magi that kind of begins to make them look like they're popping right out of the Harry Potter story. You know, this guy, Albus Dumbledore, he's looking like this, and you kind of get this picture of who, who these Magi are, and, and uh, you know, short for magicians, but I, I don't know if it was true back then, but most magicians, they're kind of kooky, aren't they? Sort of like wonky, kind of weird. I mean, Penn and Teller, really? I mean, and David Blaine, they're just kind of, you know, maybe it's, it's, it's a bit of a lousy word for us to associate entirely with who they are, because when you begin to kind of peel back the layers, you realize that they were at the top of the ladder. They were most revered. They were scientists, they were educated, they understood the stars and the skies, they were uh, into all of that. They were certainly wise men, referred to as wise men more than anything else that they're referred to in Scripture, but also kings, referred to as kings from the East. But even more to it than that, there's a book called Histories, written in 440 B.C. 440 B.C., that's a classic. (laughs) <laughs> As written by a guy named Herodotus. Herodotus wrote this epic book in 440 B.C. called Histories, and he describes and likens their skill and abilities as to the fame of this uh, collection of wise men, this department of wise men. And the reason that they were so sought after was because of their discernment, because of their insight, because of their wisdom, because of their interpretation, and, and, and not just as kings, because, you know, like, you know, knowledge is power, and if you've got it, you were, you know, sort of at the top of the heap. But even more than that, they, they weren't just kings, they were, and, and, and here's the clue as to why Herod was so troubled and freaked out by their arrival. They're not just kings, they're king makers. They're king makers. And, and, and their decree would overarchingly 
rule depending on who the king was who happened to be reigning at the time. That's how much they were revered. That's, that's who they are. And that's why it's not just Herod, but he's got the whole city trembling with him. It says Herod was troubled and all of Jerusalem with him, right? Like when you're troubled, we, we, we kind of in our human nature have this uncanny ability when we're troubled to pull everybody down into our trouble with us. Herod is doing that to a whole new level with all of Jerusalem now troubled with the arrival, not of these like wandering magicians looking for their next gig, but these kingmakers that are going to declare a decree. In fact, it's interesting, all the way back in the book of Esther, which is a tucked in book that gives a lot of insight sheds a lot of light into the into the history of the old testament Uh, in the book of esther their rule is 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 on display as as proof of the power that these that these wise men had at their disposal and uh, you don't have to turn there but let me just pull one verse of esther out and show it to you it's in chapter 1 verse 19 And it's in the midst of Queen Vashti, which is how the book of Esther begins. Queen Vashti has been ruling there in the days of Esther. And many of you are familiar with it. We studied it together in our midweek men's study and women's study not too long ago. And things are not going well for Vashti as the beginning of, of the book of Esther would point out. In fact, she's on the brink of being impeached. Now, you just couldn't do that in a nonchalant sort of a way. There was a process and a constitutional authority that was overarching in the way in which you would remove a royal from their reign, from their position. And Vashti's about to be yanked. She's about to be pulled. She's about to be impeached. And this verse shows up in Esther chapter 1. It says, If it pleases the king, let a royal decree go out from him, And let it be recorded in the laws of the Persians and the Medes. Now that would be a reference to this overarching reign that the wise men possessed. Let it be recorded in the laws of the wise men, the laws of the Persians and the Medes, so that it will not be altered. Like what they say goes. All right? So that's why, that's, that's why Herod is shaken in his royal boots. Because what these guys say throughout history is what goes. And you could point to that not only, you know, in the writings of this classic histories book from the 400s before Christ, but you would see it throughout the entire Babylonian Empire, into the Medo-Persian Empire, into the Greek Empire, into the Roman Empire, how, how these guys were established and set up to say and declare and decree what was up and it wouldn't be altered so that it will not be altered. And here's what they decreed, that Vashti, she's queen, shall come no more before King uh, Ahasuerus and let the king give her royal position to another who is better than she. So there is the, um, there is the constitutional authority to make such a claim and, and decide for such a decree to be established. That is, the, that is the power of the influence that the wise men had throughout the history of the Old Testament. In fact, it shows up in the book of Daniel. Turn there with me. Daniel chapter 2 is that other passage that I mentioned to you that's going to like now complement our Christmas story from Matthew chapter 2. And I think you're, I, I, I hope, I, I think you're going to find it rather fascinating uh, how it all dovetails together. In fact, some things are going to stand out that sound very similar to what we just saw and studied and and, and read together in Matthew chapter 2. In fact, look at verse 1. Daniel chapter 2, verse 1. Got it? Say, got it? Now, in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, he's king at the time, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, 
And his spirit was so, what, say it, troubled, that his sleep left him. Sort of like our staff right now. <laughs> They've been up since two in the morning. We had this whole room decked out with the three crosses of the crucifixion, right? We had the Cretion family and the Grove family out at the first scene. But in this scene, we had the crucifixion going on. All the chairs were out. Stage was out. Catwalk was out. Manger was out. Crucifixion was in. And after the last group went through last night, this whole room got turned over because, I, lo and behold, it sort of dawned on us as a staff that you all wanted a chair to sit in. I don't know why. I stand up every Sunday. I thought you'd all want me to stand with me this morning. So you have this scene going down in here. And uh, if you could just sort of like use your imagination for a moment that, that, that now you've entered into this room where Nebuchadnezzar is troubled by a dream that he has had and you've kind of entered now into his palace and into his presence and he hasn't gotten a wink of sleep in nights, his sleep left him. Verse 2, then the king gave a command to call the magicians and the astrologers and the sorcerers and the Chaldeans. Those are all synonyms, by the way, for the wise men. Okay, I'm going to show that to you in a moment, but it's all going to be sort of like packaged up with a nice bow on it. And, 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 and these would all be synonyms for the same status, for the same department. For, for, the, for the same title, wise men, okay? They're magicians, they're astrologers, they're sorcerers, and they're Chaldeans. To tell the king his dreams. So they came and they stood before the king. So just imagine that. They're like walking in before him and the king said to them, I've had a dream and my spirit is anxious to know the dream or to understand the dream. So the Chaldeans spoke to the king in Aramaic and said, O king, live forever. That's a very rare language interestingly enough, that Jesus speaks Aramaic, that the wise men spoke to the king in Aramaic and said, king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will give you the interpretation. And the king answered the Chaldeans, and he said, uh, my decision is firm. Look what he says. If you do not make known the dream to me and its interpretation, You'll be cut in pieces. Okay, so a little pressure to get this one right. You'll be cut into pieces, and your houses shall be an ash heap. However, if you tell me the dream and its interpretation, then you'll receive gifts, rewards, and great honor. Therefore, tell me the dream and its interpretation. And they answered. I think their um, knees are knocking right now. They answered, and they said, Well, let the king tell his servants the dream, and we will give its interpretation. And the king answered and said, I know for certain that you would gain time. In other words, they want to, like, push pause and delay this thing out as long as they can because you don't want to get this one wrong. I know that you would like uh, to gain time. You would gain time because you see that my decision is firm. But let me just remind you. Look at verse 9. just want to remind you again. If you do not make known the dream to me, there's only one decree for you, and it's not a good one. For you have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me till the time has changed. Therefore, tell me the dream, and I shall know that you can give me its interpretation. So the Chaldeans answered the king and said, you know, this is kind of a hard thing you're asking. There is not a man on earth who could tell the king ma king's matter. Therefore, no king, no lord, no ruler ever asked such things of any magician or astrologer or Chaldean. It's a difficult thing. This is hard. This is a difficult thing. Difficult thing that a king requests. And there is no other who could tell it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. And for this reason, the king was angry. Very furious, verse 12 tells us. Gave the command to destroy all the wise men. So there you have the collection of the department. Now with the banner covering over the Chaldeans, over the astrologers, over the soothsayers, over the sorcerers. Just going to call them wise men now. And the king says, wipe them all out. Destroy all the wise men of Babylon. And so the decree went out, verse 13, and they began killing the wise men. And they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. Then with counsel and wisdom, Daniel answered Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. 
And he answered and he said to Arioch, the king's captain, why is the decree of the king so urgent? Then Arioch made the decision known to Daniel, and Daniel went in and he asked the king to give him time that he might tell the king the interpretation. And Daniel went to his house and he made the decision known to Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah's companions that they might seek mercies from God in heaven concerning the secret. So Daniel, they, what they do, what do they do? They pray. They immediately go to the Lord in prayer. And the secret, verse 19, was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. So Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Look at verse 24. Therefore Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. You're like, I didn't know there were so many wise men in the Bible. You should read it. It's a great book. Uh, he goes to this guy who's now been you know, given and appointed the command to destroy all the wise men. And, and he went and he said thus to him, Do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. And take me before the king, and I will tell him the interpretation. And so Arioch quickly brought Daniel before the king and said thus to him, I have found a man of the captives of Judah who can make known to the king the interpretation. In other words, Daniel saves the whole lot of wise men that are being destroyed, of wise men that are uh, being sought to be put to death. Listen, he saves all the ones who couldn't cut it because they couldn't interpret the dream that are about to be cut up. Daniel saves all of them. And he does so because the Lord has given him the insight, the revelation to understand the dream. And he comes before the king. And the king answered and he said to Daniel, look at verse 26, whose name is Belteshazzar, are you able to make known to me the dream which I have seen in its interpretation? And Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, the secret which the king has demanded, and the wise men and the astrologers and the magicians and the soothsayers, right, there's all the synonyms, cannot declare to the king, but there is a God in heaven. Amen, church? Amen, that's a good amen. But there is a God in heaven. So the first thing he does is he seeks the Lord in prayer, and the Lord reveals, gives him the divine revelation of the king's dream so that he can interpret it, and he gives all the glory to God. In verse 28, there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days, your dream and the visions of your head upon your bed were these. As for you, O king, thoughts came into your mind while on your bed about what would come to pass after this. And he, capital H, that's God. God who reveals secret has made known to you what will be. That's futuristic. That's prophetic. That shows up in the gifts that the three wise men bring to the baby born in the manger. They're not like looking through their saddlebags, finding something that they could re-gift or wrap up. These are divine gifts that are going to point to what will be gold representing king, frankincense representing royalty, that will be, and myrrh. Myrrh always used in the preparation of a body for burial. That will be. Daniel is the only one in this whole division and department, scope and scene of the wise men throughout the reign of Nebuchadnezzar. He's the only one who could come and rightfully interpret what will be as a result of the dream that has Nebuchadnezzar so troubled. Look at verse 30. As for me, the secret has not been revealed to me because I am more wise than anyone else. It's not because I have more wisdom than anyone living, but for our sakes who make known the interpretation to the king and that you may know the thoughts of your heart. You know, it's not the only time that this happens. Where, where Daniel is given such a blessing 
from the Lord. To be able to see and understand what no one else saw or understood. It happens a number of times. In fact, turn over to Daniel chapter 4 with me. Daniel chapter 4 is that chapter in which this same king, Nebuchadnezzar, has another dream. Another dream that's got him all shook up again, filled with anxiety and trouble. Look at verse 5, Daniel 4 verse 5. I saw a dream which made me afraid. This is Nebuchadnezzar speaking. And the thoughts on my bed and the visions of my head, they troubled me. Therefore I issued a decree to bring all the wise men of Babylon before me that they might make known to me the interpretation of the dream. And the magicians and the astrologers and the Chaldeans and the soothsayers, they came in and I told them the dream, but they did not make known to me its interpretation. But at last, Daniel, verse 8, Daniel came before me. His name is Belteshazzar, according to the name of my God. Look at that, small g. He's like been rebranded. Daniel has. He's in captivity. He's from Israel. He's been brought to Babylon by a slave. He's shown himself strong and wise. And he's been rebranded. He's been renamed in the name of Nebuchadnezzar's God. Check it out. His name is Belteshazzar, according to the name of my God, but in him is the spirit of the holy God. And I told him the dream before him, saying, Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians. Okay, so what's happened? What's happened since Daniel chapter 2? He has now been promoted. He's not just one of the wise men. Because he's the only one who could interpret correctly the king's dream, he is now chief of all the wise men. Now this this is classic for us to connect the dots and see how it relates to the story that we started with in Matthew chapter 2. Because I think there's a legacy here. There's a shift occurring. And now you have a new chief of the wise men, a new chief of the magi, because I know that the spirit of the holy God is in you, and no secret troubles you. So explain to me the visions of my dream that I have seen and its interpretation. These are the visions of my head while I was on my bed. I was looking and behold a tree, and he goes on to his dream. You can read it later. That's not the only time it happens. Look at chapter 5. Turn to Daniel chapter 5. Now you got a new king. And guess what? With this new king, he's dreaming some of them scary dreams. Like all shook up, filled with trouble and anxiety. Look at verse 8. Daniel 5, verse 8. Now all the king's wise men came, but they could not read the writing or make known to the king its interpretation. Then King Belshazzar was greatly troubled, like just like Herod. Greatly troubled. His countenance was changed, and his lords were astonished. And the queen, because of the words of the king and the lords, came to the banquet hall, and the queen spoke, saying, O king, live forever. Do not let your thoughts trouble you, or let your countenance change. There is a man you just might want to meet. A man in your kingdom in whom the Spirit of the Holy God. And in the days of your father... Light and understanding and wisdom like the wisdom of the gods were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, made him chief of the magicians, chief of the astrologers, chief of the Chaldeans, chief of the soothsayers, inasmuch as an excellent spirit and knowledge and understanding in interpreting dreams and solving riddles and explaining enigmas were found in this Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar. Now let Daniel be called, and he will give the interpretation. Then Daniel was brought in before the king. The king spoke and said to Daniel, Are you that Daniel? who was one of the captives of Judah, whom my father, the king, brought from Judah? I've heard of you. Now, interesting. You got some wise men that are going to emerge in following the example and footsteps of the new head over all the wise men that are going to follow a star that will lead them to the region of Judah. You got a king here who's like, are you that Daniel guy from uh, Judah? Are you the one that my dad 
I've heard of you, that the Spirit of God is in you, that light and understanding and excellent wisdom are found in you. Verse 15, now the wise men, the astrologers, who've been brought in before me, that they should read this writing and make known to me its interpretation, they can't, they can't give the interpretation of this thing at all. But I've heard of you. I've heard of you, that you can give interpretations and explain enigmas. Now, if you can read the writing and make known to me its interpretation, you shall be clothed with purple. That's royalty. And you'll have gold. You'll have a, you'll have a chain of gold around your neck. There's the gold. And you'll be the third ruler in the kingdom. Daniel answered and he said before the king, keep your gifts. Let your gifts be for yourself. Yet I will read the writing to the king and make known to him the interpretation. O king, the most high God. Look at his witness. Look at it. The most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar your father a kingdom and majesty and glory and honor. But guess what? And you can read this for yourself later. There's now a writing on the wall that says your life has been put in the scales. Your life has been put in the balance. And guess what? You've come up on the wrong side of the stick. You've been weighed and found wanting. That's the interpretation of your dream. And you're like, whoa. It's deja vu. Because long before Daniel steps in, not once, not twice, not just with one king, multiple kings, three times, and accurately interprets the dream that's been dreamed on his bed or the writing that's on the wall of the palace, long before Daniel would ever show up, remember this, Bible students? There was another man of God, a wise man, who interpreted the dreams of the Pharaoh that no one else could interpret. Dreams that had the Pharaoh troubled. And all of a sudden, somebody in the midst of Pharaoh's court, king of the world at the time, says, there's a guy I remember named Joseph. And Joseph comes before Pharaoh, cleaned up out of serving his sentence for something he never did in prison, and accurately interprets the dreams of Pharaoh and is promoted as is Daniel for his wisdom. Guess what? There's another guy in Scripture. He actually shows up in the book of Numbers. Read anything from Numbers lately? You don't have to turn there. Here's the verse. Check this out. Uh, the utterance of Balaam. Anybody remember that guy? He's actually referred to as a prophet and a wise man. So he's like of the same troop, the same tribe, the same realm, the same department, but he's gone a little crooked. And God actually uses a donkey from the petting zoo at the living nativity to speak truth into the prophet's heart, for he's become all greedy and selfish. But when he was tracking with the Lord, he had some wisdom to be able to discern what was right and how God wanted the the people to react. In fact, here's an example of it. The utterance of Balaam, who hears the words of God and has knowledge of the Most High, who sees the vision of the Almighty, and who falls down with eyes wide open. He sees things. Look what he sees here. Check it out. This is in the book of Numbers. I see him, but not now. It's prophetic. It's speaking of what's to come. It's futuristic. I see him, capital H, but not now. I see him. I behold him. But not here, not, not near. And a star. It's like numbers. Numbers 24. And a star shall come out of Judah. And a scepter shall rise out of Israel. Wow. Would you love the scriptures? Don't you love just coming and studying and seeing the light go on? That there's all this rich backdrop and historical narrative that backs up what now is taking place in the Christmas story that sometimes, if we're not careful, we'll read and think we understand it all. And it's so deep. And the dots get connected. And 
And all of a sudden you realize that back in the days of Joseph, there was something going on that would spill over into the days of Balaam of something going on, being promised of what's to come, that would spill over into the days of Daniel when all the whole lot of the wise men were in jeopardy of being wiped out and destroyed. And there would be as a result of God's favor and protection and handiwork in place, a remnant. That Daniel gets promoted to become the chief over all of the wise men. And if you don't think I just want to say this. If you don't think that changes the direction from being a bunch of hocus-pocus guys, like a bunch of psychic hawk line guys, a bunch of horoscope guys, you got Daniel who's the only one who's able to interpret it. The other ones are a bunch of frauds. And because he's promoted by the Lord, just like Joseph was, so that the fulfillment of what was promised to Balaam in the days of the book of Numbers, it would change the direction, it would change the authority, it would change the leadership, it would change the example, it would change the source of what the wise men have been trusting in. And now they're trusting, not in themselves, but in the one that Daniel repeatedly points to, the God Most High. He's like, I'm not wiser than anybody else. But there is a God. And from Daniel's influence comes a remnant of legacy of wise men that are looking for the truth. Wise men who show up in Matthew chapter 2 and are included in the miraculum as an object of wonder in the Christmas story. Not a bunch of trickster magic, but guys that are genuinely after the reality of worshiping the true king. What sets them apart? What does Daniel provide for these guys that causes for them to drop everything that the rest of the Orient found themselves living for and to take this on as the banner of purpose for their lives? Let me give you five fast things. You can jot them down if you want. First of all, they received a true revelation, just like Daniel did. They received a true revelation in light of all of the fake news. <laughs> in light of all that would surround them culturally at the time, they received a true revelation. Don't you think God is still trying to get our attention through that today? Not through how the rest of the world wants you to live and wants to squeeze you in to the, to the mold of their own, you know, being conformed to the culture, but, but, but a true revelation revelation that would guide and direct your steps like it does the wise men that are now living in the legacy of Daniel, the one who saved all of them from being cut up and destroyed and their houses caught on fire. They received a true revelation. Secondly, they researched the readings, just like you're doing right now. They got into the Word, and God bless you for it. It never returns void. It's going to bring about blessings in your life. Why? Because you reap what you sow, and you sow into this, you're sowing into the goodness of the Lord, and His Word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path, and it will guide your steps and lead you into everlasting life. And the Word that they researched became flesh and dwelt among us. That we too, you want to be wise? would pray for that same eye-opening divine revelation of the meaning and purpose of our lives. And we would research the readings and study the scriptures. And they study it. They're like, where is this king going to be born? And they do exactly like that Christmas card said that somebody sent to me. Followed a star that led them to the light of the world. Thirdly, they showed great resolve. Didn't they? This isn't like around the corner. This is from the east. This is from the Orient. This was thousands of miles hiking through the desert. It wasn't easy, but they had great resolve, longing for the fullness of the promise that they had been filled with because of God's favor over Daniel that changed the entire heart and direction of the wise men to which now these are the heritage of. They wanted to be in his presence. 
They wanted to be filled with his power. They wanted him to reign supremely over their hearts and over their lives. And it was great resolve that they showed to get there. Fourthly, think of the risks that were taken. That nothing mattered more. They left palace. They left kingdom. They left the realm of their position. They risked everything. They risked it all. And it didn't matter for what they were after where the birth of this new king was concerned. Why? Because they had received such a true revelation of God's plans for their life. And they researched it and confirmed it throughout the readings of Scripture, showed great resolve and regardless of the risks. And fifthly, think of the rewards that they forever received when they came into his presence. Think of the rewards. The rewards of these, you're going to meet these guys in heaven. And I think there were more than just three. I think we limited it to three for a couple reasons. There were three gifts, and there's only room for three on your coffee table. <laughs> but we're remembering them right now. That they followed the truth of God's divine revelation. They researched the scriptures to know where to go and who would they find but Jesus himself when in showing great resolve regardless of risk they were rewarded as they came into his presence and you know what the Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 2 they left differently than they arrived how about that horizon how about leaving differently today not just because you go home a different route because you've come into his presence and worshipped him just like they did. They left differently because of all that he had promised to accomplish, promised and woven throughout the narrative of the history of Scripture from Genesis with Joseph into Numbers with Balaam. Daniel, my goodness, what if you left different? Because here's the truth where our object of wonder is concerned today. You can't spell king. You can't spell king. Like you can't spell stable without table. We learned in part one. You can't spell manger without anger. That God took the wrath and anger of the punishment of God upon himself when Jesus was born with the purpose of going to pay the price for our sins on the cross, you can't spell manger without anger. And all of the anger of God was transferred to his son when he was born a baby in Bethlehem. And this morning we realized that you can't spell king without the word in. It doesn't matter to these wise men whether or not he was a king in some other foreign country. It didn't matter if he was king in heaven. It didn't matter if he was king in history. He needed to be king in them. And you can't spell king without N. To invite him inside to be your Savior, your Lord, and your King. Not just a God who's in heaven, but who's in you. As literally as he was born in Bethlehem as King, may he be born in our hearts as King. In charge. In control. And he's not, if he's not king in you. He's not. Unless he's king in you. And those gifts, those gifts that they give him as they worship him, this newborn king, would foretell the story of his life, as we've seen. But you can't spell gold without the word old. And that's what gold needs to become for us. 
It needs to become the old motivational value. It's asphalt where the reign of our king and his kingdom are concerned. Gold needs to be the old motivating value in your life for something better and greater and more valuable has been born, has come along. You can't spell frankincense without the word rank, and I wonder where he really ranks in your life. Is he supreme? Is he top? Is he king of kings and lord of lords? Royalty is where they ranked him in the giving of their gold and their frankincense and their myrrh. 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 Always represents sacrifice and death. And you can't spell myrrh without the little word my. And my is what needs to die. So he can be king. So he can reign. So that all that he came to accomplish throughout all the history of the Bible could be fully accomplished and completed in you. And so our wisest move, like the wise men, would be to come and make him our king. Amen? Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you so much for the fun that it is to see these dots connected throughout the pages of your scriptures. Lord, it's amazing to us to see all along this has been your plan and how you revealed things to Joseph and to Balaam and to Daniel. You revealed things to us in this room today, maybe things we've never seen before. And I pray that that would draw our hearts closer to you, bowing down in reverence and worshiping you as the king alone who is worthy of our worship. How amazing that must have been when those wise men finally reached their destination, came into the house, saw the young child with Mary, his mother, fell down and worshiped him and left for their own country a different way. May their legacy that was Daniel's legacy become our legacy. That it be you that we celebrate and not just on Christmas. It would be you that we worship. Not just one day, but every day. 24-7. We bow before the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Maybe this Christmas Sunday there is something in your heart that has taken his place. I know for me, my, my needs to die. Your, my needs to die. So he can be king so he can have his way. And has, he has been proclaimed king and savior and master and lord so many times throughout the last three evenings of the living nativity. We pray that there would even be those among you in church today who would not leave here the way you arrived. 
but differently. As you let him in to be your king, your savior, your meaning, your reason, your purpose, and ultimately your destination. And Lord, we pray the same for tonight's outreach. That it'd be a grand conclusion to an awesome week and set us up for a wonderful celebration tomorrow evening on Christmas Eve. And I pray that you just would bless abundantly these families who have come to worship you today and proclaim you as their King of kings and Lord of lords. In Jesus' name, be born in us, we pray, both now and forever. And everyone said amen.